In the final hours before the United Nations deadline to withdraw from Kuwait, Baghdad prepared for war. Saddam Hussein appeared on television to assure the Iraqi people victory would be theirs. Talk of retreat was punished by death. You are the new leader of the Arab world, he was told. Saddam laid out his strategy. The Americans and British, he said, rely too much on technology. They never fight man to man. They can never win the battle. Across America and Europe, midnight vigils marked the passing of the deadline. Many feared a long and bloody war, another quagmire like Vietnam. At dawn, the president signed the order that would take the coalition to war. He was ordering people into situations where they would lose their lives, and the kind of magnitude of that awful decision, I think, haunted him. You know, how much is a life worth? How much is a, are a hundred lives worth? A thousand, ten thousand. Seventeen hundred coalition aircraft now prepared to attack. They faced modern Iraqi fighters, hundreds of missile batteries, and thousands of anti-aircraft guns. Some Pentagon estimates had suggested one in five aircraft in the first attack might be shot down. The American air planners hoped the attacks would be precise and powerful enough to bring Iraq to its knees. To begin with, the army occupying Kuwait would hardly be touched. Instead, strategic targets all over Iraq would be obliterated. Before the planes could attack, a unit known as Task Force Normandy had a critical role. Its Apache helicopter crews had been training for months. Their mission, to destroy at all costs two radar sites that could give Baghdad early warning of what was to come. It was a moonless night. Eight Apache helicopters laden with Hellfire missiles took off towards Iraq. This is a pilot's eye view, video from one helicopter's night vision camera. The gunships flew a few feet off the ground until they were eight miles from the radar dishes. We slowed our airspeed to about 40 knots, came up on line, all abreast, so we're all at the same distance from the target. And at this point, I'm not looking through my goggles. I'm looking at a TV screen right uh, in front of me. Watch the clock tick to zero. I gave the code word, get some. At that point, everybody fired their hellfires. OK, did you get the go? Uh... Out of the probably 150 people that we were brief were at the site. I, I would imagine not more than 10 or 20 probably lived through that engagement. Time to launch. One minute, sir. Off the coast, the U.S. Navy prepared to launch dozens of cruise missiles. But the missiles couldn't navigate over featureless desert, so they were secretly programmed to fly over the mountains of Iran and then turn towards Baghdad. Zero, five, zero, attack, four, eight, east, state. The Iranians had no idea of any of this. The Navy commander prayed nothing would go wrong. We were dealing with neighboring countries who we didn't want to join into the fray. We'd never used them in conflict before, 
and uh, there was a lot of apprehension about do we launch these things and then they make up their own mind where they're going. In Baghdad, the guns began to fire. Ten stealth bombers were minutes away. They were designed to be invisible to radar, but as insurance, the US Air Force started to jam Baghdad's radar. The jamming gave the game away. The defenders' radar screens were blinded, but 3,000 anti-aircraft guns and 60 missile batteries fired wildly into the sky. That night, orders came from headquarters to fire back any way we could, even if it meant closing our eyes and firing into the sky. It was so dark, and the aircraft were coming so quickly, and we didn't have the capability to aim accurately. That's why they told us, put up a barrage of fire any way you can. In the approaching stealth bombers, the pilots saw the firestorm of shells and missiles exploding above the city. They flew straight towards it. What we wanted to do was sever his ability to communicate with his frontline forces. And if that meant killing him, then so be it. Holy cow. That was a large airburst that we saw. It was filling the sky. And I think, John, that airburst took out the telecommunications. CNN journalists gave a running commentary to the outside world. Six minutes after the stealth bombers left, the crew's missiles arrived. Some destroyed government buildings. Others dropped carbon filament to short the electrical grid system. With the initial attacks complete, an armada of coalition aircraft headed for targets all over Iraq. Hundreds of planes took to the air. Despite the initial successes, scores were expected not to return. As the battle unfolded, Norman Schwarzkopf sent a message to his troops. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, this morning at 0300, we launched Operation Desert Storm. My confidence in you is total. Our cause is just. Now, you must be the thunder and lightning of Desert Storm. Planes were in the air at that time, heading towards their targets, uh, with, with no guarantees of the outcome. Uh, to know that we had taken a very big step and, and that the war had started and none of us knew exactly how it was going to end. Uh, it's a very, very emotional moment. With key air defense headquarters destroyed, Iraqi fighters couldn't operate. Only a few managed to struggle into the air. Our fighter aircraft had orders to attack, but who? The radar was blank. The first Iraqi fighter of the war was shot down. I see that somebody's targeted on me. It's an Iraqi fighter who wants to target me and shoot me down. And so I remember firing a missile. I remember seeing this big blue flame coming across the sky three to five seconds long. And I remember seeing it and, and then it goes away. And I remember thinking to myself that, uh, that my missile hit him and that the target's destroyed and that he's down, but what's ahead? AWACS planes. Boeing 707s packed with computer equipment helped control the battle. The coalition armada systematically attacked Iraq's war machine, the factories that made chemical and biological weapons, the Scud missile plants. In all, that night over 200 different targets were hit. The first 24 hours consisted of more attacks in the master attack plan than 
the entire number of targets that were targeted in the years 1942 and 1943 during the combined bomber offensive in Europe. That night marked a new point in warfare. Precision bombing had become a reality. Only one Allied pilot was killed. At the White House, the politicians were euphoric. The first night of the war, everybody was, uh, you know, in, in, in heaven. They, well, they saw these strikes go in very successfully. Casualties were almost uh, nil. Um, television pictures of bombs going down chimney stacks and all that sort of stuff. And uh, some of the reporters were running around saying, this is going to be over right away. And I had to call down to the Pentagon press office and, and tell them to shut those guys up. We have just started a war. It isn't, it isn't a one-day affair. You know, it's not going to be over before the next commercial break. Just before dawn, the RAF attacked an airbase near Basra, Iraq's second city. Lacking American technology, for years the RAF had trained to surprise the enemy by flying low and fast. It was not a tactic they'd had the chance to use on a modern battlefield. Out there it was burning blue, I mean it was probably 8 o'clock in the morning, 8.30, and it was blue sky and the visibility was a thousand miles. We were flying at maybe 60 or 70 feet and about five or 600 miles an hour, and there's this huge explosion and a flash, and the aircraft just, we, was hit by a missile. When I had blue above my head, suddenly the desert was above my head and it was just tumbling. I couldn't see the back of the aircraft. All it was was uh, a, a, a ball of fire, and the fire was spreading its way down the spine of the aircraft towards me. And then you say, this aircraft is going no further. And then you go, give me the ejection drills, you know. It's actually half a second between pulling the handle and being thrown clear of the aircraft, and that half a second's like a lifetime. And then it's as if someone, a huge giant, just grabs you by the shoulder. He yanks you up, and I remember my head going forward. And then there's the crack as the canopy opens, and you're left in your parachute. And it's deathly silent. And there we were about to land in the, uh, in the desert in Iraq. Uh, and then you realize how big the desert is and how clear the sky is. We'd gone from these uh, modern day nights on our high tech chargers flashing around the sky in 20 million pounds worth of technology and suddenly there we were, you know, two very sad pink bodies in the desert. Then, after about three hours, we s saw some Iraqis coming towards us and shots started to ring out, and they were shooting at us, they were trying to kill us. And we were down low, and, and I can't see it, and I remember John looking at him here as we were down, and going, should we go out with a bang? Uh, and I don't know why, I, I just said, no, there's, al there's always hope. Saddam Hussein was moving between safe houses in the suburbs. The bombing had been destructive, but hadn't inflicted the civilian deaths Saddam had judged would outrage world opinion. His former intelligence chief says when he briefed Saddam on the situation, his temper flared. I said, I know that Iraq will be destroyed. I am telling you the truth. Saddam said, these Americans are technicians, not soldiers who fight. They have technology on their side, but that won't help them win. Saddam had already planned where to strike back. That morning, when he met his ministers, he ordered action he believed would shatter the coalition of Western and Arab countries attacking Iraq. Mobile launchers hidden in the desert fired Scud missiles at Israel. We had the capability, we did it. When you are attacked by an enemy, you attack your enemies. That's natural. The scuds were fired indiscriminately at Israel's largest city. Saddam judged the Israelis would retaliate and join the conflict. The Arabs in the coalition would then refuse to fight alongside Israel. The coalition would collapse, and so would the war. Soon, more scuds were on the way. 
Israel's nuclear forces now went on full alert. 60 Israeli jets took to the skies. Early warning radar appeared to show Iraqi bombers heading for Israel. The American Defense Secretary picked up the hotline to Tel Aviv. Israeli retaliation seemed inevitable. You can imagine an American president uh, sitting quietly as missiles land on the United States saying, no, we're not going to do anything. I mean, it, that's an unacceptable political position for any government. The Israeli army reported nerve gas in the debris of one of the missiles. Israelis prepared for the worst. We knew we had a real problem at this point because if Israel got into the war, this was a real break for Saddam. If he provoked the Israelis into attacking him, then the chances of holding the coalition together really uh, became problematical. I must say that this is the, the darnest way to con conduct an interview. With Ultimately, none of the eight scuds that landed that night proved to have chemical warheads. The, uh, the kind of threat we're facing. After some discussion, Baghdad had decided the Israelis might retaliate against a chemical attack with nuclear weapons. Uh, actions that are necessary to remove it. Some of the Scud missiles were loaded with chemical warheads, but they weren't used. They were kept hidden throughout the war. We didn't use them because the other side had a deterrent force. The man who decided what happened next was Israel's Prime Minister, Yitzhak Shamir. He and George Bush disliked each other, but now Bush telephoned him. An angry Shamir told the President, if America couldn't stop the Scuds, the Israeli Air Force would. Bush said to Shamir, pleaded with Shamir, tried to cajole Shamir, that Israel not take any military action, that this would be injurious to the cause of, uh, to the Allied cause, that in the final analysis, this, this would also be injurious uh, to Israel's cause. I think in such situations, you have not to play with words. It's not, it couldn't be a moment of diplomatic discussions and debates. And well, I explained to him, it's very difficult, Mr. President, it's very difficult. I don't know what the day of tomorrow will bring, but at this moment, we will act accordingly, in according, accordingly with new concepts. Israel became the president's top priority. We are going to be redoubling our efforts in the darndest search and destroy effort that's ever been undertaken in that, out, there, out in that area, and I hope that that is very reassuring to the citizens of Israel. But Norman Schwarzkopf believed the Air Force should concentrate on winning the war, not placating the Israelis. He was furious at Washington's interference. He called them uh, pointy-headed politicians who had never fought, them, fought their way out of a wet paper bag. From my perspective, from the strategic perspective and the president's perspective, and obviously I was doing this with the president's approval, was it was vital to keep the Israelis out of the conflict and that the way you did that was to make certain that they knew we were doing everything humanly possible to deal with that scud threat. Cheney overruled Schwarzkopf. Aircraft started to crisscross 28,000 square miles of desert, hunting for perhaps 14 mobile scud launchers. They couldn't find them. Neither could they find the convoys bringing supplies of fresh missiles. They used to transport the Scuds to us in civilian buses. They'd take out all the seats and slide a missile in through the back. Even if the bus was spotted by an enemy plane, the pilot would assume it was just full of passengers. But there was another way to hunt Scuds. SAS columns were fighting deep inside Iraq. Schwarzkopf distrusted special forces. But five days before, the SAS commander had persuaded him to make an exception. There had to be people on the ground. 
that the human eye cannot be replaced by technology. We were well armed, we had good strength, we above all had the desert as our friend to retreat and hide into. We were told in very categoric terms that our priorities one to ten were scud, scud and nothing but scud. For 43 days, the SAS patrolled the Iraqi desert closest to Israel. They called it the Scud Box. This is the only film of an SAS column. It was taken by the gun camera on an American helicopter flying in to take back a prisoner. Within two days of the SAS arriving, there were no more launches from the Scud Box. Columns like this caused mayhem, destroying radar sites, microwave towers, and cutting communication cables. And when they saw Scud convoys, they attacked them. America had rushed Patriot missiles to Israel and Saudi Arabia to shoot down Scuds. In the skies above Tel Aviv and Riyadh, they dueled with the incoming missiles. The Patriots got as close as they could and detonated, filling the air with shrapnel. In Israel, the Patriot became a symbol of resistance, damping down the pressure for Israel to join the war. Patriot is 41 for 42. 42 scuds engaged, 41 intercepted. I view it as an honor to be here, to come to Raytheon, the home of the men and women who built the Scud Busters. We're very... But the Pentagon was claiming a kill every time a Patriot exploded near a Scud. Senior British intelligence officers didn't believe the figures, and neither did the Israelis. <laughs> <laughs> On the ground in Tel Aviv, the Israeli military analyzed the damage every time a scud fell to earth. What they concluded was kept top secret so as not to give comfort to Saddam Hussein. When I met President Bush in Washington, we had some human argument because he was convinced that Patriots were doing a great job. I told him that uh, at the very best, uh, the, the intercept ratio maybe was 20% uh, intercept probability. He asked me what I meant by that and I said that Maybe out of every 10 scuds uh, Patriot strider intercept, they might succeed in, uh, with two. But uh, in retrospect, uh, I was overstating the case. I, I think that probably not a single uh, scud was intercepted by a Patriot. The Patriots struggled to react to scud missiles traveling at six times the speed of sound. The myth of the Patriot helped keep Israel out of the war, but most of the scud warheads got through. Only after the war did the Pentagon acknowledge the Patriot's limitations. Patriot was an air defense system designed to shoot down aircraft, not missiles. Again, what I remind everybody, all my friends in, in the United States who think we've got defenses against missiles, we don't. Tel Aviv was targeted by Scud missiles fired from western Iraq. Fresh missiles were brought to the launchers along these desert roads. SAS men hid along them. One eight-man patrol was codenamed Bravo 2-0. Bravo 2-0 was tasked to insert into Iraq some 300 kilometers by helicopter to set an observation post up in the hope of seeing mobile scud launches driving past and then communicate back to base and call in coalition aircraft. The main supply route wasn't a tarmac road, it was a track system. And as I look northeast, there were two S-60 and aircraft guns. We got enemy right on top of us. It was about mid-afternoon on the second day, and we started to hear goats coming from the north. And then we heard the young boy start to come along and shout at his goats. And his eyes come up like saucers. He knew there was something wrong. And straight away just went running off towards the anti-aircraft guns, just screaming and shouting. We packed all our equipment up and uh, started to move out of the wadi. Uh, within half an hour, we were engaged by a local militia force and a firefight ensued. We first heard that Bravo 20 was in trouble when we got a, a garbled radio message. We really didn't know what had gone wrong. 
we launched our helicopters and as it turned out we were looking further south than they actually were. The patrol had become scattered. McNabb led one group of five men. It started snowing. It was plain to see if the weather don't kill us, the enemy will. And we were continuously getting compromised by these goats. The whole land was covered with people herding goats. So I made the decision that we're going to hijack a vehicle that night and go for the border. McNabb and the four men with him did just that. But close to the border in a series of gun battles, two died. The others were hunted down. I decided to hide in a drainage culvert about four kilometres from the Syrian border. I have no idea what happened, but it was just chaotic sort of shooting. So I knew I was in the shit. As I was pulled out, I, uh, it was the first time I'd been out in daylight. Uh, beautiful sunny day, and you could see Syria. You could see the high ground of Syria, which was severely pissed me off, because you were so close you could literally taste it, you know. Um, and that was it, I was captured. Meanwhile, the other three patrol members had started walking to Syria. The cold killed one man, another was captured, the third reached the border. It was night. I started to move around the edge of a building. A guy came out about 200 metres away. He saw me. I hid behind a, a mound. Uh, two guys started to walk down. I could possibly bluff it by letting them walk past me. As it was, they came right on top of me. Uh, I took the first guy out with a knife. Uh, the second guy started to run. I caught up with him and uh, we grappled on the floor and he ended up with a broken neck. On the last night when I started to collapse, I knew I was getting very, very close to dying at that point. I knew I had to get water. There was a goat herder's house. I staggered up there. A young guy came out and greeted me. I asked if this was Iraq. He then said, Syria. He pointed back and uh, showed me where Iraq was and assured me that uh, I was safe. The bombing of Iraq continued. The RAF was having a difficult war. In these early days, its losses accounted for a quarter of the coalition's total casualties. A crew's life expectancy could be measured in weeks. Whatever reasons may have been given after the war, the reason those aircraft crashed was because they were flying low level for one reason or another. Maybe they flew into ground, maybe they were hit by flak, maybe they were avoiding flak, but they were flying low level. And so one said, well, is this necessary? Is this a sensible thing to do? And the answer was, no, it isn't necessary, and it's not a sensible thing to do, and I don't want to go on doing it. The American command admired the men, but were dubious about the tactics. They would happily have cancelled missions against airfields the Iraqis were not even attempting to use. The crews also suggested a change of tactics, but it didn't happen. It was going to impact on the whole of the RAF's strategy and put it into question. And as a result of that, there was a great reluctance in the MOD for it to change. And we weren't allowed to change it. The commanders on the spot were not were forbidden to change it. Shrapnel has gone through here and has gone out through the top of the wing. Only after another tornado was lost, and with sharp questions being asked by the Americans, did the low-level attacks stop? Well, I think it was quite disgraceful uh, interference by the Ministry of Defence in the tactics, not, not, not the policy, not the strategy of the war, the tactics of running that war. Aging Buccaneer jets, the aircraft the tornado was meant to replace, rushed to the Gulf. They carried equipment to laser designate targets from higher altitudes. Splash. That was an excellent splash. Soon they were working in tandem with tornadoes, dropping laser-guided bombs. <laughs> A week into the war, the air planners still believed by bombing Iraq they could deliver a decisive victory. Much of Iraq's air force had been destroyed on the ground. The coalition controlled the skies. It could bomb at will. Bridges, power plants, communications, all were destroyed.
But Saddam did not withdraw from Kuwait. He was determined to sit the bombing out. He would say, it's no problem. We can rebuild everything, even the morale of the people. You could sense the, the angst and, and uh, anxiety and unease throughout the American body politic. Gosh, it's been going on for a week. Why isn't it over? Hey, maybe it's not going well. What, what are we trying to do? And we had not been sort of on stage to explain what we were trying to do. So I went up to see uh, Secretary Cheney and said to uh, the secretary, you know, we, we've got to do something because uh, this is, you know, we're, we're starting to lose the public on this one. Secretary Cheney and General Powell are here to... Uh, the fear the American public might turn against the military, as they had over Vietnam, influenced Powell's thinking throughout the war. And uh, then the General Powell Public relations was the war's second front. As a measure of effectiveness of how we're doing in the air campaign, I just pull these two things out. I've laundered them so you can't really tell what I'm talking about because I don't want the Iraqis to know what I'm talking about. But trust me, trust me. <laughs> Officially, Saddam was not a target. But the Allies launched 260 missions against sites where they thought he might be hiding. Eventually, spies reported Saddam slept in private houses, changing location every night. You can find out perhaps where he has been. You can find out even where he is. But what you need to know is where he's going to be because you must mount an attack. And so it's almost a, uh, an impossible task. You might find it strange, but the president of the Republic of Iraq was sometimes driven around the city in an old taxi. It's strange but true that Saddam also used a lorry to move around the city. These are some of the measures he resorted to. The Air Force kept searching. These pictures prompted some of the more improbable missions of the war. Saddam was inside an American motorhome known as a Winnebago. When we saw him sitting in a Winnebago, we went after the Winnebagos uh, with a vengeance, and uh, whenever we saw one, or tried to find one, and whenever we saw one, or two or three, we would, we would attack them as quickly as we possibly could. Iraqi soldiers in Kuwait opened a pipeline flooding the Gulf with oil. The aim was to destroy the desalination plants that provided Saudi Arabia with drinking water. Saddam wanted to provoke an early land war and inflict casualties to undermine Western resolve. The desalination plants continued to work and a bombing raid cut the flow of oil. If the Iraqis wanted a ground war, they would have to attack. Saddam ordered his forces to move on the abandoned Saudi border town of Kafji. Saddam said, capture four or five thousand American, British and French troops. We'll use them as human shields. We'll tie them to our tanks and overrun the Saudi oil wells. If we do this, the Allied jets won't attack. That evening, the U.S. Marines sent an unmanned spy plane on a routine flight over Iraqi positions in southern Kuwait. It beamed back television pictures to a truck at the launch site. What do we have Holy here? Crow. Let's see what they are. Man, this is something. The Iraqi attack on Kafchi had begun. The town was undefended. It had been evacuated on the first day of the war after the Iraqis shelled it. In the control vehicle, Marine helicopter pilots awaited orders to attack. But the orders never came. We'd been on the landline back to our wing headquarters, letting them know what was going on. We started, you know, a million and one scenarios began running through our minds on, you know, why in the world would they not be letting us launch on these vehicles? Guess what? Closer, closer. 
and uh, 2,253 hours. They've crossed the border. Cross. in Saudi Arabia. King Fod's going to be pissed. Fod Baby's going to be pissed. He's, he's going to be hot. For an hour and a half, the Marines watched the Iraqis advance. Back at the Air Force headquarters, the war had settled into a routine. That routine didn't include an Iraqi attack. Where's our air? This is ridiculous. The frickin' bomber couldn't ask for any better target than that. Why was the Iraqi advance not stopped prior to Kofji? A very straightforward, simple question. Deserves a very straightforward, simple answer. It was not the Air Force's best day. The Iraqis occupied Kafji. They did not know U.S. Marines had hidden in the town. One of the six-man reconnaissance teams was headed by Chuck Ingraham. Lawrence Lentz commanded the other. I got the team together and I said, we've been practicing for some of us five years to play in the big game, and now here we all of a sudden get a chance. I think we ought to stay. And they agreed. You're the only people there, yourself and another team of your buddies somewhere else in the city and you know that that's it, um, the point of no return. Stand by. The Hawkins missile will shoot it down range. Take that bad boy out. Baghdad announced a great victory. But by dawn the next day, American artillery was in position. The Marines inside Kafji gave precise radio instructions telling the guns where to fire. When I finally got artillery fire, it was the best feeling in the world. Everything we called in was what we call danger close, which simply means that it's so close that the round could actually hit us instead of the enemy. At every moment, the Marines in the town expected to be discovered. Rockies came very close to capturing us. They were inside of our building for at least a day. You could see their heads down there, and if you wanted to, you could spit on them. Two days later, Saudi forces formed up to retake their town. The attack would cost them 19 dead. Perhaps 100 Iraqis died in the town. Meanwhile, airstrikes destroyed two Iraqi divisions desperately trying to reach Kafji. For months, Saddam had proclaimed fighting on the ground would bleed the coalition and undermine its resolve. But the attempt to reinforce Kafji was a bitter lesson in what air power could do to an army that surrendered control of the air. Saddam became tense and anxious, although he tried to conceal it. He was restless. It wasn't so much that he cared about the casualties, but they exasperated him. The attacks on Baghdad continued. Stealth bombers by night, cruise missiles by day. The missiles used the hotel where foreign journalists stayed as a final position check before heading for their targets. Coalition prisoners were now held in Baghdad. This character came in, uh, looking at my teeth. You knew that something was going to happen, but you, you, again, you were hoping that maybe it wasn't. It was maybe some stupid, you know, they're doing it for a laugh, but there's nothing you can do. Um, and in fact, what he done, he got a, uh, uh, like a pliers or a pinchers or whatever they were, and he took the back quarter uh, of the tooth out. I was struggling, I was screaming, and it was, this is a demonstration of what we can do. Do you really think we're going to help you? You know, we can just let you die. There's no problems with this. They just yanked me up and just karate chopped uh, through and kind of felt like the heel of the, the boot just into my knee. And I collapsed again and they just pulled me up, smacked, 
pull me up, smack, pull me up, smack, pull me up, smack. And eventually, and somewhere in there, whilst they're doing that, they say, are you pilot or navigator? Are you pilot? And eventually, uh, pilot. And it just came out. I couldn't, I couldn't stop it. And that's when you realise you've broken to the violence. You feel a desperate sense of failure that you've let everyone down. I thought everyone would thought I was a traitor and that everyone would see that I'd failed and that that was the last image my family was going to see of me. Terry and Gary, I love you. Somebody came up and he said, we're going to execute you or you can go on TV. And uh, it was a stark choice of, you know, make the broadcast or be killed. I think this war should be stopped so we can go home. I do not agree on this war with Iraq. And that was, I think, the...